Welcome to St. Paul United Methodist Church Music and Message segment. We are glad you joined us. Let's just praise the Lord. Good morning. Good morning.
achievement. Her GPA is a 4.57. <laughs> So the newspaper clip that you can see on the right 
talks about um, in 1947, you can see the work being done on the church as that top structure was finished. And then on the left is 1951 program for the grand opening of the church. And you can see Pastor Gibson, he's in the top right corner. He was involved in, commu in uh, various community activities and groups. So he was the president of the Birmingham Business League. He was a member of the Jefferson County Coordinating Council of Social Forces, which was an interracial group that was working to find solutions to the, quote, bitter hatreds, unquote, that existed between the black and white races. And Arthur Shores was the vice president of that group, and the group was no joke. He uh, was also involved in an effort to fund and create an African-American hospital to improve medical services for black people in Birmingham. And that group was the Jefferson County and Birmingham Hospital Association, which was founded by ministers um, of different denominations to raise funds to build this 100-bed hospital. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> the slides you can see are pictures from that 1951 program, and they are of the unfinished interior sanctuary where we're sitting now, and then of how the basement looked when they were um, having services down there before the top structure was finished. Next slide, please. The Ministers' Wives Association was um, an interesting organization that I found a history of in the conference archives. It was established in 1940 at the annual conference in Huntsville. And the wife of the district superintendent for each district was in charge of organizing the Ministers' Wives in her district. So Mrs. C.J. Booker was the first president of the Birmingham district, and the association would make a donation each year to the conference's pension fund to help support claimants to the fund. So the, the pension fund of the Central Conference, the, the Black Methodist Conference, was always underfunded, of course, right? <laughs> so they made it their mission to, um, to bolster these funds so that retired ministers could live comfortably. So in 1940, they raised $20.21. That was their initial gift to the fund. And by 1972, they were able to raise $6,011.20 uh, $6, that year. So presidents from this group included Lots of names connected to St. Paul. Mrs. Myrtle Coleman, um, Mrs. Fanny Turner, Mrs. Irene Wilson, Mrs. Evelyn Lowry, Mrs. Addie Flannoy, and Mrs. Mary Brown. So all of those, all of those women were married to men who passed through the St. Paul at some point between 1940 and 1972. So it shows you how connected St. Paul was to the Central Conference. Um, <clears throat> next slide, please. A lot of this project was a collection of personal stories and interviews, and one of the things that really struck me as I was doing interviews was the stories that people had about growing up in the church, and how the church members nurtured the children spiritually and supported them and made them feel safe and accepted. And so many of the people I interviewed said things along these lines, but I thought Deborah Walker stated it really beautifully. Um, we're going to try to play the sound clip from her, if we can. village and folks took care of us. We took care of one another. Um, many of the folks who attended St. Paul were educators, so uh, they were very concerned about our, for me, our, my educational, emotional, spiritual needs. And so it was, it was a really safe environment from where I sat, because um, I knew they cared about me. And the picture you can see is Ms. Ellen Nunnally, who came up in a lot of these interviews, too, is somebody who had a really big impact on the lives of the people who were children in the church, growing up in the church. And that was from a 1966 program. Oh, sorry, I'm not talking into the mic. Um, we also heard, you can go to the next slide, a lot of the compelling stories about the civil rights movement and how St. Paul was a part of that. So this excerpt is from an interview with Cecil Flannoy describing his experience of a mass meeting in memory of his father working with other ministers during the movement. Can play the clip? The main thing I remember is um, the meeting that was held at, at St. Paul. And, uh, like I said, it was supposed to be in the, I was supposed to stay in the parcel of the into the place that the buildings were connected. And so I went on into the sanctuary to see what was going on. And I mean, it was like standing room only, the place was packed. And, you know, they had people speaking and they had, you know, playing music and just a lot of things uh, going on. 
Uh, I also know that there were white pastors at the time that my dad and other Methodist pastors, and uh, he would talk to people about what could pastors do to help you know, ease some of the tension and, and, and help resolve some of the issues. And you know, I, I know he used to have a lot of meetings like that. Okay, next slide. And this is a picture of the police surveillance report from the mass meeting where the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights was planning the Palm Sunday March. So you can see on that far right page where it says the meeting place is St. Paul. That's a long document, but I thought you might like to see it because it's cool. <laughs> uh, next slide. St. Paul played a really important role in the Central Conference as a mother church. And um, it was also played a key role in the efforts to merge the conferences when they um, went to desegregate in the 1960s and 70s. So in 1964, um, Dr. Lowry and Reverend Charles Hutchinson were part of a group of black and white ministers that would meet to strategize for this merger of the conferences. So the first of these strategy meetings was held at St. Paul. And then <clears throat> Lowry went on to serve in other of these uh, tri-conference bodies. So he was on the Joint Committee on Interconference Relations with Calvin Pinkard, who was from the North Alabama Conference, and Paul Duffy, who was from the Alabama West Florida Conference. And then that body turned into the Tri-Conference Advisory Committee on Merger. And both Dr. Lowry and Charles Hutchinson were members of that as well. So both of those men, in this connection to St. Paul, played this really important role in strategizing for the merger of the conferences. The United Methodist Church was officially formed in 1967. The conferences each had to vote on whether or not to accept it. So in 1970, the Central Conference voted to accept the merger. And of course, the white conferences didn't vote to accept it at that time. In 1971, the North Alabama Conference voted by one vote to accept the merger. And then finally, in 1972, the Alabama West Florida Conference accepted it. So 1972 was the last year of the Central Conference. And then an interesting fact, too, about these interracial tri-conference working groups was that the Greater Birmingham Ministries grew out of them. So they kind of gave rise to that that's still going on today. So these little pieces of information I've shared just scratch the surface of what we've uncovered over the course of the project. And if you feel like there's something that you want to add, if you have a story or photos or documents or anything that you'd like to share, please get in touch with me. And um, we want to include everything we can in our effort to capture, preserve, and share this important history of St. Paul in order to inspire the visitors and the next generation especially to be the change that they want to see in the world. Up next is Dr. Penny Seals. She's going to talk to you a little bit about uh, Dr. Charles McPherson and the NAACP at St. Paul. <laughs> and he uh, really persisted and really aimed to 
drive membership and the NAA, the national NAACP headquarters um, really leaned heavily on Dr. McPherson to revive the Birmingham branch and increase the membership. Um, and at one point, the racial violence in Birmingham was so uh, just extreme that even Dr. McPherson became discouraged. And, um, but again, he persisted and continued to operate the Birmingham branch and work to increase membership and also civil rights activity. His primary goal was to make the Birmingham branch, and this is a quote um, from him, one of the most active and militant branches in the South. Um, eventually, McPherson's efforts and dedication paid off, and between 1931 and 1934, um, the Birmingham NAACP branch saw significant growth as a result of McPherson's work. Um, and this largely was, was in part due to the Scottsboro case and also the Willie Peterson case as well. Um, and McPherson worked really hard on those cases to get the word out and to raise funds. Um, for that case. It is also important to note that during that period, 1932 through 1933, that Reverend E.O. Wolfel served as president of the NAACP uh, Birmingham branch as well. And so together, him and McPherson um, really worked to get the Birmingham branch revived. Um, and then in 1932, McPherson was awarded the Madam C.J. Walker Award by the National NAACP headquarters. Um, and the national office stated that in the face of prejudice, prejudices, handicaps, and dangers, that McPherson had taken an active interest for the defense of the Scottsboro and the Willie Peterson cases, um, and that he did that, and also reviving the Birmingham branch, he did that with tact and with courage. Um, McPherson died in 1948. He died due to injuries from an automobile accident. He never got the chance to uh, see the games, the civil rights games, during the 50s and the 60s. Um, at Dr. McPherson's memorial, which was held right here in St. Paul, right here at St. Pa Paul, Reverend H.D. Gibson noted that McPherson held the NAACP together until the rest of the world could wake up to his challenge. <laughs> He spoke and others were afraid to speak. Dr. McPherson's legacy continues to inspire us today. His dedication to the principles of equality and justice serve as a constant reminder of the importance of standing up for what is right even in the face of adversity. His legacy serves as a beacon of hope and a call to action for future generations to continue the fight for equality and justice for all. And so next we will have uh, Ms. Joy Ryan. Suffered the first loss of a friend ever. 
survived Ku Klux Klansmen firing into a group of protesters, all for the sake of equal rights for herself and black people. The various suffrage who had on trials for justice and equality for a new generation that leaves her wondering if it was all in vain. Times have changed so much since she, she attended conferences in Mississippi with her grandmother, who began bringing her to St. Paul United Methodist Church because there were other children her age. Before that, her family attended a Baptist congregation. At St. Paul, she found a home, support, comfort in times that she herself called fractal. St. Paul taught her faith in any situation that she needed. Her parents soon followed their children to St. Paul, but the children led the way. The way to change in faith for her family, and later, the children led the way for a change in civil rights. LaVeria began her interview telling us where she grew up in the city of Birmingham, Alabama. Her father was an upholsterer, a trade that she learned from him and continues to this day. When asked when she plans to retire, she's responded simply that she doesn't. I refuse to sit down and do nothing, her proclamation. Those words are a testament to a child who, like she followed her father's lead in the profession, did the same during the civil rights movement and became a leader in her own right. LaVeria remembers when her father began to come home later than usual. When asked where he was, he would tell his family that he was attending mass meetings where plans were being made to fight for civil rights. Plans that would include the least expected of groups, the youth. Bear in mind that this was a time of bombings, lynchings, and downright evil acts committed towards people of color, sometimes for no reason whatsoever. Other times for what the youth were expected to do, demanding equal rights and the end of the Jim Crow laws. Even still, when recruited, there was no hesitation on the parts of Liberia or her parents. Dr. King's vision was clear, and the faith of the people of color in the South and in the city of Birmingham was in that vision. LaVeria explained that it took children to get what they wanted done, to bring about integration, to show that children could lead the way. The youth were going to be the ones to bring attention to the wrongs that people of color faced in the Deep South at the hands of Jim Crow. In preparation, they were taught how to ball up if they turn the hose on and to protect themselves from the dogs. They were taught hymns to sing throughout protests and while jailed, which was known to be inevitable regardless of their ages. This is frightening to read about, to think about, and so it can only be imagined how terrifying it was to do. Yet these youth, equipped with these lessons and ironclad passion, began picking and protesting peacefully. The plan, to keep the jailhouse full, to have young faces singing, we shall overcome someday, even while sitting in a jail cell. Even when once arrested, knowing that they would be at the mercy of the same ones who are denying them their civil rights. The children and their parents and community members knew the dangers of these acts. Everyone knew of the abuse of, the pow the abuse of power that kept Jim Crow alive and well in the South. An example of one such abuse of power that these youth face being threatened if they didn't stop singing their freedom songs. The threats were followed through on for some. Those brave souls were sent to the sweat box, a jail cell where they turned the heat up until the children sweated, then turned hoses on them, and repeated this process until the officers were tired of committing the torture. That didn't stop these young people, though. They kept on and continued. They and their parents followed the direction that when they were picked up, by their parents, they were to go back and pick it, face a certain and repeated incarceration. As scary as this sounds, and as scary as Liberia admitted it was, there was a camaraderie in coming together. It was even fun to work. Some parents would pick their children up from the jails each time they were taken, but not Liberia's. Laughing, and she explained, my father, in his mind, he wasn't going to keep going to get us and picking us up. She went further to spell out that Dr. King told the parents not to pick their children up so that they could keep the jailhouses full. Every night, Laveria's mother would ask her father when he was going to pick them up, and every night, her father would tell her he'd go get them the next day. That was, until my mother insisted, you're going to go get my children today. He did, and as planned, they went back to protesting. 
This time, instead of marching, they were directed to picket the Liberty Supermarket. Standing, demanding equal rights, Liberia and her family experienced members of the Ku Klux Klan shooting into the crowd. People were shot and shot at for demanding equality. People were shot and shot at during a peaceful protest. People were shot and shot at for being black while doing so. The protest continued into Easter, and these you knew because of the times that there would be no Easter baskets or shoes or outfits. Laveria, sharing the thoughts at the time, expressed that it was okay. It was for a good cause. Can you imagine children going through all of this with only the faith that civil rights would be granted? Children knowing that their rights were greater, were a greater reward than dyed eggs, baskets, and new clothes. Even during her interview, the fear faced during these times was evident decades after her survival. The very good smile and laugh about some incidents, but others broke her heart. Even all of those years later, when we're calling them. One, the first loss of a friend, Cynthia Wesley, her classmate in the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church. Months after the youth protests had begun in September. The day that 16th Street was bombed, I attended Catholic Mass with my old sister and planned to call my grandmother to tell her to come pick me up, but I fell asleep. When I woke up, I learned about the church being bombed. Though her missing the service that morning may seem to be seem as favorable, it wasn't, at least not for the burial. The hurt that I experienced that day was unbearable, she explained. She was devastated. She was inconsolable. Her parents and siblings attempted to help her understand what had happened. They tried to ease her pain, but nothing worked. For Laveria, there was nothing they could do. Laveria couldn't bear attending St. Paul United Methodist Church for a long time after the bomb, and on top of the loss of her friend, she explained that it was just so devastating to see the church bomb. Just seeing the ruins was too traumatic for her. Thinking back on these times, the things that she's seen and survived, Laveria seemed just as, if not more, devastated by the state of things today. Suddenly, when asked if she had any words for the future generations, she shared her thoughts. When I look at the kids of today, I feel like what I went through for them, for myself, was in vain. Because these young people don't have respect for each other. They're killing each other. She feels that we've come a long way, but we've also lost a lot of ground, a lot of footing. Young people need to get themselves together, she said. When asked how, she willingly gave a few pointers. Learn to agree to disagree, and they will find that they have more in common with each other than they think. When the police stop you, just say yes, yes sir, or no sir. Have some respect for each other, and this one's my favorite. Your character speaks well of you, and how you respond to people speaks well of you. Wise words from a woman who knows through first-hand experience that the children did and still can lead the way. She knows the power that the future generation holds in bringing about change. If only they could and would come together. Let's not let their pain in the way for us be in vain. Jesus Christ. 
Christ returns. God will do this, for he is faithful to do what he says, and he has invited you into partnership with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Now we'll have a special music selection um, from our St. Paul Youth Kids soloist, Mr. Vidal Lee.
able to say to others, particularly the people we disagree with, grace and peace to you from God. Where does this grace and peace come from? From God. Authentic grace and peace cannot come from us. It is a gift given by God to us in order to share it with others. Maybe as you listen to this word, there's a friend, a colleague, a family member, a fellow student that you have not been on the same page with lately and you don't know what to do about it. Offer them grace and yeah, you're still with me. It's past lunchtime, but you're still with me. <laughs> Why don't we try doing what Paul is doing in this introduction? Bestowing grace and peace from God, offering thanksgiving to God for the gifts the person has, and telling them the things we appreciate about them. We spend so much time telling people what we disagree about them or what we dislike about them. We hardly ever get around to telling people the things we appreciate about them. But Paul did it completely differently. He began to tell them what it is that he was grateful to God for about that person. Spend some time thinking about the good things that God is doing in the lives of others and celebrating it. And celebrate. <coughs> May God bless each of us as we seek to serve. And that was a sermon there. You are only some minutes next week. <laughs> Thank you for worshiping with us. We pray you were blessed from this worship experience.